Welcome back. And our um, anchor on our live stream channel is Tim Alexander. Tim is back. He, of course, pops in during the week of his emergency reports. Tim, you've got a tremendous number of news articles to cover, so let's roll. We've got issues to deal with the Middle East. you got the missile tests that occurred as well. Kind of uh, jokingly said how it was a trillion, multi-trillion dollar boondoggle that they could actually work when there was a real war situation. Uh, lots of things to go over. Let's roll. Oh, kitty. Well, uh, there's an interesting article, Understanding the U.S.-Israeli Business of War. Uh, it's from Veterans Today. And um, I, I, I don't normally quote as much uh, as I did from this, but this is something I, I urge people to go uh, and actually read the full article. Uh, let me let me just read a couple paragraphs because I mean this is there are two, two this cover there are two different aspects to this. Um, you know, one is the uh, Israeli attacks on Americans, and the other is the use by both the United States, Israel, and other entities of of uh, micro nukes. Um, we have a, and okay, I'm reading from it now, quote, we have a number of questions for Israeli friends, questions about 1967 and questions about who attacked who and how many Egyptian prisoners were executed in the Sinai, how many Americans were murdered on the USS Liberty, why um, Israeli teams were overheard planning the 1983 Marine barracks bombing in Beirut, Beirut. Uh, questions only those who ask the hard questions know of. Uh, one IDS sniper team has spread stories around Israel that they killed 400 American troops inside Iraq, and they brag about it constantly. Gets back, we're not deaf. One day we may have questions for the American pe- officials that knew of this and chose to keep it from the American people. So, and it goes on and on. I, that is, uh, uh, you know, I mean, these guys are supposed to be our allies, and we've been giving them untold uh, billions and billions of dollars. I think three or four times the amount we've spent on the entire space program from its beginning to right now we have given Israel. Um, and then, of course, it, it, it talks about uh, uh, some other things, uh, you know, some of the more disgusting things, how uh, they're using, uh, and, and they're not really arresting the people. They're bombing churches. Uh, they have a uh, price tag thing where they're putting spray painting graffiti on Christian churches, and then they they paint Jesus as a monkey on them. And, and you know this is just horrific and obscene and insulting to the core. Uh, and and nobody can stand up to no matter what. Israel does or tolerates. That's why we saw both both candidates just kissing their their butts, you know, publicly. Tweedledee tweedledee and Tweedledum, I guess, is what we should call them. Yeah, yeah. I'm a Christian, and 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 I don't insult the the Jewish faith, and I don't e- uh, even insult the Muslim faith or the Buddhist faith, or uh, you know, and I, I may have some profound disagreements there, but I, I respect people as human beings. But when somebody insults Christ and and my faith, I, I get a little bit upset about it, particularly when it's my tax dollars is it's, it's paying for everything. Well, you presume that they're that the uh, so-called state of Israel is a really like the ancient Hebrews. It's not. There are Torah Jews in Israel, but they're a minority. The majority of Israel either secular agnostics or the Sabbatean, which is Satanistic Jews. They follow Shabbat and, and Jacob Frank, that uh, uh, was born 50 years after Shabbat the Palestinian Antichrist. And they turn the Torah upside down. These devils run the banks. They run pretty well, I call Hollywood. They run our foreign policy. We can see that the, the, the tail, which is Israel, is wagging the dog, which is America. Yeah, uh, the, a country maybe the size of Delaware is, is running the United States and Britain and France. And, and uh, it, they get by with it because their money buys people off and buys the media. But quite frankly... Uh, and, and of course, they want to scream anti-Semite if you if you say anything. Well, now hold on here. Yeah. Uh, this is my country. Too. Well, actually, they're they're the anti-Semites. You do genetic tests, and they did them. I know. The actual Palestinians are biologically and genetically identical to the so-called real 
Jews that are in Israel that are not the Khazarian Jews, which, by the way, they intermarried with them so much that they genetically can't be distinct. And when they tried to create a race-specific bioweapon, they couldn't because they're too identical in both blood group analysis and, uh, and genetics. They're basically brothers. And, you know, when I hear also the latest, and I hear some experts there, one of them was uh, Henry L. Nyman saying, well, that SARS wasn't a race-specific bioweapon. I'm sorry, Henry. You have your areas of expertise in terms of recombinomics. I have a background in infectious disease as well, and I can tell you the uh, 2009 H1N1 flu originated from Baxter Laboratories facility. It was a triple recombinant, according to the top virologist in Canberra, Australia, and that recombination could not occur in nature. It had to occur in a laboratory. When it was released, it had the recombinations that allowed it to spread very rapidly through the population. Now it's mutated and passed on those lethal genes. And we have to see the same thing going on. And by the way, I do insult religions that I consider toxic to humanity. And that includes Islam, Sabbatean Judaism, and what I call off-the-wall Christianity, where they don't adhere to the principles of Jesus and the, Torah, and the ancient Torah, which is a foundation with the prophets, for what Jesus said, I did not come to abolish these things, but to fulfill them. So in other words, real Torah Jews... Torah Judaism is the father of modern Christianity, and Jesus is the link between the two. And, uh, and Sabbatean Judaism is not Jewish, okay? It's not Jewish. And when we, well, we're, it, not it, anti, it, we're not anti Semitic when we uh, say that. The, the Jews of, uh, of Christ's time certainly would not recognize it. Well, the Jews of Christ's time, a lot of them were either Sadducees or Pharisees, which are also apostate. People didn't, didn't realize the Babylonian apostasy had already occurred. Right, uh, but but the point mm -hmm. is that uh, so much of the Talmud was written by by rabbis long after uh, the death. Oh of yeah, Christ the Talmud and, and the Talmud and Zohar and all the other nasty books. Um, so what I see happening is even if we wanted to protect Israel, because I I want to defend the state of Israel, they won't integrate. The, even though they're doing a military drill right now. They don't fully integrate their their air force. They'll do games together, but they won't integrate their air force, their defenses, and their intelligence services with ours. They are doing industrial espionage and selling our military and other industrial secrets to countries like China. I mean, they're not the best uh, ally money can buy. Israel uh, is no, actually, you know, they're probably the worst. But uh, that's what I mean. I mean, it's sarcastic because it's like. Uh, Excuse me, Israel is not behaving properly. And then if they do something stupid, and I heard both of these idiot candidates saying this, both of them, that they got Israel's back. No, no, Israel doesn't set the agenda. Israel doesn't set the agenda of what they're going to do. And all they need to do is either Obama or Romney, whoever becomes the president, needs to pick up the phone and talk to the powers that be. And it's not just the mullahs or Mr. Assad, it's Mr. Putin and the head of the Chinese, because this is a proxy war with Russia and China. It just happens to be that Syria and Iran are the proxy nations that are the players on the board. That's all it is. Yeah. We still, by the way, there's an interesting article I link. We still have about 70 nuclear uh, devices, 70 nuclear bombs uh, on an American military base inside of Turkey. Uh, you know, it, it, we Turkey is very close to going to war with Syria, and they can turn that spigot on any day with a false flag event. Uh, and we, yeah, have, but why, if we have nuclear bombs there, do the Turks have access to those bombs? Well, yes and no. I mean, it's their sovereign territory. It's 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 their base and our base. Uh, the, the, the way nuclear weapons I'll, I'll, have I'll worked, make a bet they don't have the launch codes. I'll make a bet, although they're... No, they, they, were... they wouldn't probably have the codes. But the way nuclear weapons have worked in, in NATO is we they may be ours, but the country there as shares possession with us. And this is how the Germans did it. And, uh, and it still do. We still have nuclear weapons in Germany. Yeah, you were know, talking about the old Pershing missiles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It scared the heck out of the Soviets. Yeah. And no wonder. Back in a moment. Selection is coming, and I guess you have a good article here about Greg Pallas. Uh Tell us about that, uh, Tim, because uh, we—I call it the frauds per minute. 
Uh, we know that uh, Soros, who was a, I call, built the $2 billion man, remember Lee Majors, $6 million man, and they'd play that song. Yeah, yeah. Ching, ching, ching. And well, Obama's a $2 billion man, made by, the, by Obama Nokia puppet, puppet uh, master, uh, George Soros Geppetto. That's his actual real name, believe it or not, George Soros Geppetto. I'm just kidding. Um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> Geppetto. He wanted, and and again, he wanted to be a real live president. And of course, uh, he has these strings, but you can't see the strings because they're financial strings. They're satanic strings, and they're invisible to the to the mortal mind that's stuck in in gear watching. What in, I call yeah, the, in, yeah. In, in in the satanic trap. Uh, yeah, exactly. uh, I, I think uh, here, here's the thing, and I I, I, I uh, two or three months ago, I linked an article said America's become the world's first fourth world country well what they what the writer meant by that and i think he really uh, hit the nail on the head of course we all know first world you know prosperous countries second world was the communist countries and third world were the poor developing countries which are usually very corrupt and so forth well what the the writer said is uh, a fourth world country is a farmer first world country that has become so corrupt but it's corrupt at the top. It, it's it's not petty corruption like you might find in a third world country. A cop pulls you over, you don't slip him twenty dollars or something. You don't you don't slip uh, the the uh, teacher of your uh, Johnny who's dumber in Iraq uh, uh, twenty dollars and suddenly he's getting straight A's. That, but. Uh, at uh, at the highest levels, everything are to- is totally corrupt, and that's what we've become in this country. Yeah. Uh, years ago, when we went to uh, the uh, computerized voting, uh, a fellow I know won a Pulitzer Prize. He wrote an article about it and said it was absolutely guaranteed to be the worst thing that ever happened in, in American democracy. And he was right, and it gets worse every election cycle. Now you have a situation where... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's his face? We were just talking about him, uh, uh, Soros. Uh, he owns all kind of computer machine, uh, voting machine companies in a company that counts votes. And uh, Romney's son and, and some people have bought in other companies. And it's basically a race to see who whose computers can steal more votes than the other guy. And I'm sorry, but that's not democracy. That's a fraud. It's 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 one more horrible embarrassment uh, to the country that George Washington and the people uh, around him uh, uh, set up. And it's it's an insult to us as human beings and as Americans. And uh, God help us if we don't. Uh, in this, because we've got to go back to a system of voting that is uh, secure. And the best way to do that is you go in, you vote on paper ballots, the paper ballots go in a locked plexiglass box, and you dip your thumb in indelible ink that takes several days to come off, so you can't go someplace else and vote under a different name. And the votes are counted in public at the precinct, and the and the totals are voted are, are posted at that precinct, and then everything's taken to a central location, so anybody can go around and 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 check the votes, uh, the vote totals at all the different precincts. Now that's how we do it in third world countries when we want to ensure. Yeah, in other words, we, have, we we know what a clean vote is, but this is definitely and what this we had dirty. also, by the way, with proxy judges. All across the country, including in Pennsylvania especially, but across the country, is they've blocked any kind of measure by the local politicians or the people to make sure that voter fraud doesn't happen in this election. And so it depends, the election is basically going to be won by he who does more voter fraud. Yeah, I, uh, I have two stories to tell about how things used to work, okay? Uh, when I was uh, a young college student, uh, I was supporting a guy running for Congress. He was the youngest judge in Indiana, a very nice guy. And uh, I knew a, a bunch of the people. I was a liberal young Democrat at the time. And election day, I was allowed in the back room of the back room at party headquarters. And I was the only young person that was allowed in there other than the mayor's son, who was a friend of mine. Well. A call came in from uh, a precinct committeeman, happened to be in a black precinct, uh, and he said, I need some help down here. So the then deputy uh, chairman of the party uh, locally said to me, Tim, grab some of these high school and college students, get a 
two, three cars and take a bunch of them down there. Well, so I did that. And we all get out of our cars, and he says, and I can't say exactly what he said, but I don't want any blankety blank uh, whitey uh, college students around here. He said, I need me some money to buy some votes. And it didn't shock me because I, you know, I, I knew these characters. But all the other kids were just like their, their jaws bounced off the, the pavement. They were absolutely shocked. Well, we went back, and I told the uh, deputy chairman, I said, the man needs some money to buy votes. Oh, oh, I'll take care of it. Now, uh, th- that's one story. The other story is my, my, um, uh, my wife's grandfather was a Republican precinct committeeman in his county, and uh, one of his sons had been the elected sheriff in the county, and another one, uh, my father-in-law had ran for state representative. Uh, on election day, the barn was always full of cases of half, bo- uh, half uh, pints or pints of whiskey, and the standard uh, vote buying then was they'd give you $2 or give you a small bottle of whiskey for your vote. Now, that's the type of corruption that we have had for many years. But when you bring it, but it only worked with a small percentage of people, okay, people that were really destitute that, that, that would sell their vote for a little bit of money. But when you bring high technology in on it, uh, and there's no trail, there's no paper trail, everybody gets their vote stolen. And so you think, oh, I'm going to vote for so-and-so because, well, he's better than the other guy or he's not as bad as the other guy or whatever. And, and you get out of bed in the morning and you make a trip down to vote and you stand in line to vote. Well, if you're voting on a computer, chances are it's, it, you just, it means nothing because well, not he who that controls way. that source code controls the outcome of that election. And, of course, you just need to tilt a little bit and then you get all the electoral college votes. So, for example, I'm going to vote Republican, but I'm in this crazy state where even though North San Diego, which is a heavy military in Silicon Valley, are primarily Republican, San Francisco and Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area, uh, which is a dominant population, are a Democrat. And uh, as a result, we're going to basically transfer probably most of our uh, electoral college votes over to the abominator. Well, it, 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 it varies by state. Now, the states can set it up so that the votes go by congressional district. But most yes. states, it's one. It's whoever has fifty point zero zero one percent, or the majority. If there's multiple candidates, the majority of the vote he takes all that state's electoral votes. Right. And uh, we set that up. Our founding fathers set that up because they didn't trust uh, the kind of elections we have now. They, they uh, I don't. You know, it, it's a screwy system. But uh, what we've got now is just a, a giant fraud. It really is. It's quite amazing. Yeah. Back in a moment with much more, and we're going to be joined by Chris Harris. A lot of updates on Fukushima. What's really going on there? We've sorted out a lot of the issues and what's happening here in America. Back in just a moment. And darn it, I wanted to get it. back and um, just wanted to make a, a little news item as we have a stroll here first before we get to uh, Chris. Uh, Robert Gibbs apparently justified the murder of the son of Anwar al-Awlaki in October 2011 and apparently with separate drone strikes. In other words, he was born in Denver. He's an American, 16 years of age. Obama sit in the situation room with his baseball cards of death. They killed the son of Anwar al-Awlaki, who's also an American, didn't go through proper process. Rather than just picking him up and putting him through a Guantanamo-type military-style trial with proper rules of evidence. No, no, no. He was an American citizen with the NDAA, and Robert Gibbs was trying to defend the idea they wanted to have, uh, you know, fight against the idea of indefinite detention of American citizens as well as terrorists. Now, I agree with the idea of terrorists don't get the same rights as Americans, but when you have American citizens, albeit this guy is the son of a... American born well, so called what we're going to have to Bill, what we're really going to have to worry about in the future, and I've been involved in military uh, aerospace, yeah. including with drones, 
is, you know, you can have drones that can fly for over a day. In fact, some they're, they're looking at uh, very yeah, Well, they're going to have solar ones. It'll go for basically continuous. They have new ones, and now yeah, they're continuous they kind of do. like a... Yeah, what happens is some of them go to up three or four days. They're going to eventually develop them so that they're going to basically have nuclear snap engines or other technologies. Or and these they, things will they be up there. up energy to them. But, but the point yeah. is that, that, that uh, this is going to be increasingly a really bad thing because you have some jerk, be it the President of the United States or somebody deputized by him, is sitting in uh, and, and is acting as prosecutor judge, jury, and executioner uh, uh, against people, especially American citizens. And that's unconstitutional. That's not the way it's worked for 200 and some years in this country. And, uh, the, of course, the Constitution means nothing to these people. Before we, we bring on Chris, there was one thing about Donald yeah. Trump I, I, I didn't get uh, uh, the, to say. The, the, the Donald. The <laughs> Donald. Uh, the, the manipulator of media, and, of course, his, his so-called monster announcement. Tell us a little bit. Cause well, I thought, uh, you know, here's the thing. Donald Trump is a master manipulator of the news media. And at his absolute height, uh, when things were really rolling and, and real estate was really high, it was so bad that, that Donald, if he was going to walk down the street, there'd be a press release flashed and there'd be 50 reporters out there to cover it. And I'm only very slightly exaggerating. He's a master at, at uh, manipulating the media. Now, he made uh, an announcement a few days ago that yesterday he was re going to release something really earth-shaking. Everyone was going to be talking about it, uh, about Obama, and it could uh, uh, change the outcome of the election. So then yesterday, uh, the, the big announcement uh, as it came out was, well, he was going to make a $5 million donation to the charity of Obama's choice if Obama would release his college grades and his passport application. Now, that wasn't, uh, it, something says to me that this is all wrong. I believe either Trump wanted something from Obama and got it, or more likely, uh, uh, Trump was uh, getting the word out because maybe he was afraid it had leaked out and he wanted to stay alive. And he had something really earth-shattering against Obama, but they got to Trump. And Trump went to Plan B, which was this uh, nonsense about, oh, yeah, I'll give $5 million if you if you release this. And it, it hardly got no coverage. This isn't Donald Trump, and this isn't what it was all about. So something went down, and we'll probably never know the real truth, but uh, something big went down, and something big was covered up. Yeah, I, I believe so. I think you're right on. Yeah. Now we got Chris. All right. Chris, now tell, tell us what's going on. We have some very important stories that we have to update today. Uh, let's go through this. We have a story talking about the Japan's nuclear reactors, October 22nd, the Nuclear Institute report. Uh, we've got the issue that we talked about the other day where this false report came out that it was just a grass fire and then it was this exaggerated report that it was a major release of radiation. Well, I, we kind of took a, a very skeptical view of this and analyzed it. We later reported and posted up that, yes, it was a grass fire, but we didn't dismiss it. I know there were experts on other shows that said, well, this is nothing. It's not nothing. We have some sides of 30 centimeters or 0.8 meters of Building 4, which Arnie Gunnarsson talked about. We have probably a hydrovolcanic uh, uh, cauldron of, of heat, superheated steam and corium underneath there, generating steam and causing the, the ground and the substructure to liquefy. Uh, we have almost certainly some kind of explosion is the most likely cause, rather than lightning or somebody throwing a, quote, cigarette butt, which is unlikely to happen because... Uh, you were wearing a rad suit if you're anywhere in the area, and you can't throw cigarette butts from a rad suit helmet. So it's either lightning or it's an actually small explosion, and that small explosion, uh, that small explosion is probably with the cause of the grass fire, which means there's probably hydrovolcanic explosions occurring right now and per periodic major uncontrolled burps of radiation. If cooling pool four falls, we have a catast catastrophe that almost certainly, even if the structure just twists and it drains, we are going to have a, um, a pyrophoric fire of thousands of fuel rod assemblies. And these fuel rod assemblies, when they go, we're going to have a major 
explosion of radiation that probably will exceed by a very large margin the amount that came out already from Fukushima, which is probably around several hundred times more radiation than Chernobyl. So tell us your analysis of these latest reports and uh, what's happening uh, in terms of, you know, what are these guys doing? Okay, on your suggestion, I did look at very, very closely the pictures that were available to me of the uh, supposed grass fire and the causes of it. I sent yeah. to you. Uh, yeah, I saw those. I posted them up already. And you can actually see okay. the grass fire pictures there, right? And what, what the thing is, you don't ever analyze, like, how did this happen around a nuclear plant? Well, it happened because somebody threw a butt or you had a, a lightning strike. But even more likely, you probably had an explosion on the plant, either an electrical fire explosion because something is electrically not stabilized, or you had an explosion due to hydrogen that threw radioactive hot debris and triggered off a grass fire. Uh, I tend to think, as I say, when you hear hoofbeats, it's horses. This is probably an explosion on the web on the site, and that's explosion. If we could see from the satellite photos of the pictures, if there's two non-contiguous areas that are blocked by buildings or concrete, and there's grass in two areas that were hit, and probably between them, the explosion threw debris in those directions and caused them to go on fire. That's a warning sign. It tells me they deployed the Sandia Labs muon uh, imaging system to look for a shadow indicating where the corium is underground. They probably know that they are really, really, really screwed in terms of controlling this, which is why some Japanese scientists are kind of throwing their hands up. I think they know that this is going to go disastrous real soon, and they also wanted to kind of throw the story out in the Indian news to destroy the credibility of the alternate media because we want to ask questions, and we're always being held back from getting good data. Yeah, a couple of things. A couple of things jumped out at me right away. That access to where where the firemen are. First of all, first of all, they're, they're wearing radiological respiratory protection. So, unless the guy was violating, if, some, if a smoker was violating radiological procedures, uh, you're not going to have a smoker there. No, so, it, I wouldn't say it's a cigarette fire. Also, right. if you look at it, like the grass was cut. But not recently. That grass has been there a while, so it wasn't because of a lawnmower or something like that that went through there and sparked and caused the fire. Number three, there are rat ropes around where that pipe is. There's a pipe going across, and the stanchions for that are very rusty. So they haven't been, they're not new. Everything's been there. In other words, that area has been cordoned off, and it's not a, an, an area where people would normally congregate. So, you know, in other words, so it's probably not done by uh, by the story that we where we're hearing it's a cigarette fire or something like that. It's it, you'd have to really go out of your way and really want to go there. Also, I put the on the Google map the the actual location of it on the big picture. So I also sent that to you in a Word document. It's the only way I can get it to uh, to show up. And we, yeah. we can we find that later. So. Um, so I'm saying that we get history. Don't really know what was the cause, and even the Tesco's words were. Uh, were we, we can make our guesses. Uh, educated guesses tells us that they're hiding something. And uh, we won't, don't want to just be dismissive of this. this there's not a uh, giant release of radiation, but it's coming. And Chris, you've got some other updates on the uh, hydrogen fix that occurred at American plants after Three Mile Island in 1979. That hydrogen fix, they finally, the Japanese have decided that Arriva is going to fit 23 Japanese pressurized water reactors with hydrogen recombiners. Let's talk about that. I mean, that's a long time ago. How come General Electric and the Japanese government thought they could cut corners and not have hydrogen recombiners? This is the reason why they had a faux or false. Uh, hydrogen release system in the uh, TEPCO uh, reactors, Mark One reactors, that the damn thing blew because they had an argument between different engineers that were afraid to release the hydrogen because they knew that the system couldn't handle the pressures, and it caused an explosion which breached the reactor core. So, uh, what's this story about hydrogen fix for Japanese reactors? We have it posted up as well. Well, you know, after um, after uh, April. Uh I can't remember the exact date, but 1979, Three Mile Island, it, one, of, one of the lessons learned was that hydrogen can happen, can occur from the zirconium, which is the fuel 
the fuel assembly, what's, what houses the uranium, really. And when you heat that up to a certain temperature, it liberates huge amounts of hydrogen. And in the presence of steam, it still, it still liberates that, and it, it can collect in an area. And it did actually cause an explosion, in fact, of, uh, two spikes, if my memory serves me, in Three Mile Island, but it didn't, uh, didn't destroy the uh, containment. But since then, every pressurized water reactor in the United States was mandated to put in some sort of a system to recombine the, the free hydrogen back into water by combining it with uh, oxygen. And they're very expensive. They're something that uh, uh, it's a change to the plant's license. People have to become trained on it. They have to build the things. I mean, they're huge catalytic converters that you have to heat up with electric heaters to get them to work. And I can go through the whole process of, of how you put them in service and when. And so uh, they're, and they're also diesel backed up so that you would have electrical you know, power even if you didn't have elect, uh, off-site power. So they're very important to have. And it took uh, the articles that I sent you were just this week that today, uh, well, on the 25th, that um, they're going to, uh, they've announced in Japan that they're going to install these in their pressurized water reactors. We're still trying to figure out what to do with boiling water reactors. We're not out of the woods on that one yet because that's always a big problem. Um, even the ones we have here are, uh, are not 100% protected because it's a different kind of a, uh, a plant. And uh, we're trying to uh, determine whether things like igniters would be the right way to go so that it has the before the uh, hydrogen would accumulate to a an explosive concentration, perhaps a woman really way before that happened. Yeah, and by, by the way, I, I heard one person try to say that hydrogen was an implosion. No, hydrogen is an explosion. It's not an implosion. You might get an implosion after the the percussion explosion. You're going to get an implosion following the explosion, but the primary thing is an explosion, right? Uh. Oh, it's an, it's an explosion. I, I've been. Uh, yeah, I know. I, when I heard somebody actually email. email me and said, no, no, it's an implosion, I said, sorry, you need to go back. You missed that class in physics and chemistry. Um, the other story you have here is about the HAL robot. It only cuts in half the radiation because they have some, some tungsten uh, kind of blocking radiation where you wear this HAL suit that's 145 pounds and it's been now refitted so the exoskeleton usually used for senior citizens or people who are disabled uh, what they need is remote robots or either run cables or remote radiation resistant chips which are the ferromagnetic chips we developed for the u.s military built at atmel corporation in colorado springs we know out of the box in warehouse 13 the u.s government and probably the russians also have radiation resistant robots for deep space exploration but they're not going to pop these out even if the population of the world is in danger if they don't get and start to stabilize this situation soon and people don't understand this but the population of china if you're listening in china you're in grave danger uh, this doesn't just kind of spew west uh, eastward and hit the united states and northern hemisphere this can circle around go through the sea of, of japan get into the south china sea and then and within a matter of four days they detected over 22 provinces in china significant increases in radiation uh, that means 1.4 billion people in China, plus all the other people in Indonesia, South Korea, etc., are in grave danger because they're within a 1,500 kilometers of the Fukushima Daiichi site of swirling radiation clouds if this thing blows. It's not just going to hit us. It's going to really salt you guys. So uh, I would not be averse to the idea that if the international community won't move in, the Chinese will have to move in. The People's Republican Army and actually invade the area and take it over to stop a major disaster from literally salting most of China, especially along the coastal China area where all their industry is and most of their high-tech population and their many new billionaires uh, of dying from radiation sickness. I really think it's coming. I think that if we won't do it, somebody's got to do it. The Japanese aren't. The Americans aren't. Under Obama, there's no discussion in the so-called debate the other night in foreign uh, policy about dealing with Fukushima. I thought, what? This is the biggest challenge on Earth. This is like a, the radiation effects of a World War III, and they don't even have one word about it. Nothing. Well, the media has, has been terrible. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to post up a little video clip here uh, uh, of of the of the debate the other night. There's actually a singing video clip, and it's so funny. 
you look at you got to because you know I run out of clientels. It's so funny this three minute video clip. It's like, uh, please, <laughs> you know, you're there, God, God, get me out of this nightmare. Help me, help me. <laughs> it's and you have these two fools that are vying now. If we get Obama, as I said mentioned before, Obama's like having a stroke and a heart attack, and you're dead in the morning. With Romney. I think it might be better, but it would be like getting cancer and knowing you might survive chemo and radiation. Uh, either way, it's not going to be a party. We're going to have some things. Uh, both these fools want to support Israel no matter what, and this is, state of Israel is out of control. Uh, thank God internally they're not in total control because a number of their own agencies have, have done uh, we call it mutiny, including the IDF and a number of other parties like Kadima. Uh, so thank God internally they can't get away with it, but there's enough power brokers internationally that that the fulcrum point of Israel will be used to literally not only bring down the Muslim nations, but to crash America. And, of course, the point in crashing America is to bring everybody in the world toward a new debt crisis so the U.S. Federal Reserve, that's neither U.S. nor federal, will become the World Reserve Bank and then control and slave everybody and, and wipe out the middle class. And people say, oh, that can't happen. It sure as hell can. And, in fact, it's moving that way very quick. Um, closing comments... Uh, Tim, in terms of what you see happening, because I think an October surprise might be an Obama attack against the so-called Sharia Answari, I guess is the name they're called, uh, terrorists that we supplied with the arms to try to take down well, the Gaddafi I, I, regime. We, you, I think you that's still the, have. I, I, here, here's here's the thing. You've got a week and a half, a little over a week and a half. Uh, the Turks can do a false flag, pop a couple shells across the border, and everything uh, changes instantly. Uh, yeah. Will that happen? I don't know, but it's it's a significant possibility. You've got three super carriers plus an assault carrier right offshore Iran. You've got uh, the Air Force, U.S. Air Force in Israel, and the biggest joint military exercise in history uh, with uh, between the United States and Israel. Uh, it's so you're, you're perfectly set up for a, a surprise. Of course, uh, Europe is so close to going uh, totally belly up. That can happen. It both could have uh, a dramatic effect on the election. Well, the, the Iranians basically said they're going to cut off the weapons. There's any more uh, sanctions against them. Uh, the Iranians gonna... are being hurt by the sanctions, and yeah, they're, they're, they're at a, a certain point. point they've, they've, they've they're got, just going to they... close her. They're going to close the strait. And I was yeah. told this supernaturally in 1988 when I started writing Clay and Iron. This is 24 years ago. Go, that at the moment that the Strait of Hormuz is technically or otherwise closed, and it can be a technical closure, you just say, we're not shipping any more oil, and our part of the waters no longer can be used to ship oil. And that by itself will take the insurance carriers to say, gee, we're going to have to make it, you guys, uninsurable to ship oil through the Strait, and guess what? And this is quite dramatic. I think it's, what is it, uh, two-thirds, uh, almost two-thirds or 40 percent of the oil that goes by through the Middle East to the rest of the world, goes through that area. That means we're going to have yeah, immediate... Yeah, it all goes through that choke point. That, that means we're immediately going to have a triple D, oh my gosh, depression. Yeah, it, 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 we'll, we'll see how it all works out, but anything I think it's going to work out soon. I think, can have. I, I think we're not going to have an airstrike, but I think we're going to have the technical closure of the strait. Then I think we're going to have the outbreak of P30 next year. Uh, because we come so close, like the edge of a cliff or the gun with the safety off right up to your forehead. That's how close we are to a World War III scenario and a major depression. We're, we're there. This is really, really crazy. This is much more dangerous than the Bay of Pigs and the missile Cuban crisis. missile crisis 50 years ago this week. This is a thousand times more dangerous to uh, America and the whole world. You're right with God. Yeah, get right, repent, get with it, stop disrespecting those that want to save your butt, get prepared.